Well, good afternoon. Yesterday, our government released our extensive plan for the second wave of COVID-19. It's a plan that delivers $2.8 billion in new investments to ensure our healthcare system is ready for the second wave of COVID-19. But as I've said before, it's the people who make a difference in the fight. It's the thousands of frontline heroes who put up their hand and put their community ahead of themselves. Because of these heroic efforts, we avoided the worst during the first wave. But as we enter into the second wave, and as our modeling shows, some of the toughest days lay ahead. We've been hard at work over the past few months to prepare for this very moment. As we enter the second wave of COVID-19, we need to stabilize our PSW workforce. We need to make sure that when our loved ones need care, whether at home, in a hospital, or in a long-term care, there's a PSW there to support them. And that means retaining our PSWs and getting more into the system. It means creating an incentive for more people to sign up as PSWs at a time when we need them most. It's absolutely critical. And that's why today we're making a landmark investment of $461 million to help stabilize our PSW workforce by giving over 147,000 PSWs a much deserved pay raise. That means that as of October 1st, we're providing a $3 per hour more for 50,000 eligible PSWs in long-term care, for 38,000 eligible PSWs in home and community care, and for 34,000 eligible PSWs in children, community, and social services. We're also providing a $2 an hour more for 12,300 PSWs in the public hospitals. Today's funding is a first step that will provide a pay raise until March 2021. We're going to keep working with our frontline friends on, on the front lines on how we can continue to support our PSWs because our PSWs deserve our appreciation and respect. They're doing a heck of a job and I wanna give a special shout out to all the PSWs today. Thank you for everything I do, you do and I absolutely love you guys, I really do. You're amazing people. You're absolute champions as I always say. If you see a PSW this week, please be sure to thank them. And we're going to send them reinforcements. We're recruiting over 2,000 more PSWs through our fall preparedness plan. We're putting 3,700 more boots on the ground to support our healthcare system. But all of us have a role to play in fighting the second wave, in stopping this deadly virus from spreading. Yesterday's modeling data was a wake-up call. We could have 1,000 cases a day by mid-month. So again, I have to keep saying, Please don't let your guard down. Please follow the public health measures. Think about the PSWs and everyone working 12 hours a day on the front lines. Think about your grandparents, your parents, friends, and family members. My friends, we're all in this together. Please keep doing your part so we can all stay safe and healthy. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to Minister Elliott. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon. Our government's top priority throughout this pandemic has been to protect the health and well being of all Ontarians. That commitment has always included our frontline healthcare workers who have gone above and beyond to help patients throughout the COVID 19 outbreak in Ontario. Personal support workers, or PSWs, and direct support workers care for some of our most vulnerable patients and have been critical in the fight against COVID 19. That's why our government is proud to be investing $461 million to increase wages temporarily for over 147,000 eligible PSWs and direct support workers. With this investment, we are enhancing wages for eligible workers that deliver publicly funded personal support services in home and community care, long-term care, and public hospitals, as well as similar direct personal support in the social service sector. This wage enhancement will start today. Our government wants to ensure our healthcare and social services systems can attract and retain the workforce needed to care for patients, clients, 
and residents in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This investment builds on the province's COVID-19 fall preparedness plan, which includes an investment of more than $26 million to support PSWs and supportive care workers. As we prepare for the immediate challenges of the fall and a second wave of COVID-19, this investment recognizes their important role and will help ensure people get the care they need. I also want to urge all Ontarians to continue to be vigilant in following public health advice. Please stay home when you are not feeling well, even if you only have mild symptoms. Continue to practice physical distancing. Wear a face covering when physical distancing is a challenge or where it is mandatory to do so. Remember to adhere to gathering limits and wash your hands frequently and thoroughly. We are in this together and this advice continues to be the best way we can protect each other during this outbreak. Thank you and I'll now pass it over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, Premier, and, and thank you, Minister Elliott. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank all our hospital partners who have helped and are currently helping our long-term care homes that are facing outbreaks. Your assistance is invaluable, so thank you. I also want to recognize that today is Seniors Day across Ontario. Before the pandemic, I visited long-term care homes across Ontario to meet with residents, operators, and the staff. And the backbone of every long-term care home is their personal support workers. And I've always appreciated speaking with the personal support workers during my visits. Every resident in our long-term care homes, as well as their families, have stories about their PSWs and how significant they are to their daily lives. Our PSWs have been on the front lines of our efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19, and they keep our loved ones safe. They have been working around the clock to keep our mothers, fathers, family members, loved ones and friends safe and healthy. And as the Premier mentioned today, we recognize their heroic efforts. Starting today, we are providing a temporary targeted increase of $3 per hour for 50,000 eligible PSWs in our long-term care homes. And on top of that investment, earlier in the week, we announced our long-term care preparedness plan which includes further investment into hiring more PSWs. Initiatives like the PSW Return of Service Program, which will recruit and place up to 1,000 new PSWs in long-term care homes by offering them a $5,000 incentive for committing to work in a long-term care home for at least six months. The PSW Fast Track will fast track 220 students with prior health experience in a condensed PSW program and these graduates will be available to join the workforce sooner than students in conventional programs. The PSW Supportive Care Program, delivered by Conestoga College, in partnership with employers, will train 160 new supportive care workers. This 10-week intensive training focuses on the skills and competencies needed to prepare individuals to provide care in a long-term care home or a home or community setting. Throughout this pandemic, I've been meeting with Miranda Ferrier of the Ontario Personal Support Worker Association. Your voice is being heard. Our government recognizes and values the importance of our personal support workers. I want to send a heartfelt thank you to our PSWs. You demonstrate daily your commitment and compassion to the people depending on you, especially in our long-term care homes. Thank you. That's great. And Ivana, I, I also want to wish all our seniors a happy Seniors Day. Folks, our, our seniors were the people that built our towns, our cities, our province, and this great country we live in. These are some of the seniors fought for our freedoms and, and democracy, and we can never, ever forget it. And we need to take care of our seniors, the most vulnerable. So I'll take questions now. Okay, we'll go to the phone line for questions. First question, please. Your first question comes from Sean Jeffords with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Sean. Good afternoon, Premier. I wanted to ask you about the announcement today. Um, demand for services for PSWs presumably will not go away after yeah. the pandemic concludes. So why is this raise not permanent? Yeah, well, we have a few T's to cross, I's to dot, but uh, there's no one that's been fighting for PSWs more than myself. 
the two ministers behind me, Dr. Williams, everyone knows the, the work that they've been doing. I've always said they were overworked, underpaid. And, and Sean, we're the first government ever to actually stand up for PSWs, cheering them on, giving them a pandemic pay, giving them a, a raise till March. But uh, folks, stay tuned. We're, we're, we're going to help you uh, moving forward. Uh, but in the meantime, you're going to have a, a, a fair uh, raise and, and I'm going to be behind you. We're, we're going to get this done. So uh, when it comes around to March, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure this is full time. They deserve it. They're, they're hardworking folks. And what I tell the PSWs out there, I'll always have your backs. And I got I to gotta tell you a little, little story, Sean. Sorry to detract, but, you know, everyone has, has faced this one time or another. And if you haven't, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate the PSWs. I, I remember Sally. I still remember her name, Sally, that was in, in our home, my mom's home when she was fighting cancer and, and she was there every single day. And do you know it's heartbreaking? Sally would take the bus. So we gotta figure something out about travel expenses too. She would take the bus from home to home, but stayed there with my mom. She would stay there all night with her, help her, you know, clean her, you know. I'm good. Follow up. Premier, on um, on another uh, topic, the um, I'm wondering if you can tell us um, on, when it comes to a broader lockdown of the province in response to the uh, the case surges, um, are there specific metrics that you can name that your government is looking at to determine whether these broader measures um, need to be put in place? You know, what is the government? What is the command table? What is cabinet using to make a call for something that drastic? I'll pass it over, to Minister of Health. Well, we take a look at a variety of issues. Of course, the number, the increase in, in case counts on a daily basis, um, where they're happening, the hospital's ability to cope, the uh, the R factor, the uh, the reproductive number of cases uh, that determines uh, what sort of a of a. a setting we expect to reach. We released the modeling the other day, which uh, shows a, a concerning increase in cases. So we're watching this very closely uh, with Dr. Williams, with the public health measures table. But I think probably to speak more specifically to your question, I will ask Dr. Williams to come forward. Yes, and uh, thank you. And as Minister Alley has already alluded to, there are a variety of different metrics that we use because um, each one has dependency on what the region or area we're looking at. And if you're looking at a large, dense urban center, some make more sense. If you go to smaller centers where there's less population spread over a large area, a few cases would bump some of those metrics up quite high on a temporary basis. So our public health measures team continues to monitor, as the minister said, number of cases, how's that change from week over week? How's it weekly trends? How's it in monthly trends? How do we look at reproductive, the R, zero RE, some have RI, different terms around that. How is that being affected there? The testing issues, local issues, local outbreak matters. There's many things that weigh into it, including the composition of the population, whether it's widespread, rural, remote, or dense urban. So. These factors all play into giving the recommendations, and then when we get those ones, we continually review those with the local medical officer of health and their data, which is sometimes down granular to the local neighborhoods to say, what trends and directions are we seeing in your area? So uh, there are data and metrics that we use, but there are nuancing of those data points depending on the setting and the use of those in different locations where you may get a few cases increase and all of a sudden you go from low to very high for a few days, not because you have a massive increase in numbers, but they're enough to bump your rate up. But then you have to take that into consideration. So as we look at moving things or backing things off, we're looking at trends over a period of time, not just by daily or by weekly, usually over the period of we call incubation periods and then do assessment and then advise the minister and advise the uh, premier and cabinet accordingly. Next question. Your next question comes from Lorenda Redekop with CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, Lorenda. Thank you. Hi there, Premier. In terms of your announcement with the PSWs, why didn't this happen earlier, such as in summer, to prepare in advance for the second wave? Uh, are you talking about the pay increase or because we gave them the pandemic pay throughout, throughout the, the summer? 
Uh, we uh, obviously we we need more uh, PSWs. We're hiring over two thousand of them. It's a tough job, man. When you when you talk to these folks and you go go visit a long term care, you know I, I love these these people. They work their backs off for us, and uh, we're doing everything we can to to support them. I'm always going to be there for them, and they're they're incredible people. Bella. To the testing backlog, we're seeing that it's at its highest point yet. Yeah. And I've seen criticisms saying that you should have done something sooner on that to prevent this from happening. Is there something more that you will be doing? And I know that these rapid yeah. tests are, are on the way. Yeah, well, just keep in, in mind that uh, if I would have just sat back and stuck with 20,000 tests, we wouldn't have this problem. Uh, we ramped up the testing to over 40,000 consistently. We're going to continue ramping it up. But I, I just got to ask the, the folks out there, if you aren't showing symptoms, uh, please just don't, don't go get tested. Uh, we're doing quite a few different things. We've ramped up with the, the pharmacy testing with close to 80 pharmacies. We're going to continue building on that. 155 assessment centers. But the key, the key to this whole, whole issue, I always go to root cause, is the rapid test at, at home. And I know uh, Health Canada is working very hard. I know the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister are working very hard uh, to get this approved, but this is a game changer. And just imagine if we could hand these uh, these tests out to everyone, uh, be it long-term care, or the educators and, and uh, emergency service folks, or even, even yourself, um, it's a game changer. And as, as they described it to me, very, it's, it's like a, pregnancy test you you know you put the solution on and bang it'll change your color then if it does show positive you go to a assessment center and the other announcement that the prime minister made about the abbott testing that that's going to help don't get me wrong but it's not the rapid test and we're very grateful for uh the prime minister deputy prime minister for for moving forward on on that but it's it's the other test and and i i have confidence in them i i really do i have confidence that they're going to get this out and I, I really look forward to it because it's a game changer. The last thing is the lab technicians. Um, we, we just, you know, I, I wish I could turn on a switch and all of a sudden lab technicians uh, come rolling in, but I got to give a shout out to the universities that have offered to help. Uh, Western, you guys are amazing and Guelph and, and really McMaster is, is unbelievable as well. Uh, so they're, they're going to be coming on board. We just have a few things that we have to look at the regulations and, and I just got to thank them. This is why I always brag about our universities and our colleges. Colleges are producing great nursing uh, nurses, I should say, and PSWs. And then here are the universities coming in with their expertise on the labs. So every, everyone's pitching in. And I just want to tell you guys, I'm, I'm so grateful for uh, your support. Next question. Your next question comes from Miranda Anthistle with Global News. Please go ahead. Hi, Miranda. Hi, Premier. Um, an offshore wedding has been linked to eight COVID-19 cases, and it appears people who threw the wedding are not releasing the guest list, so contact mm. tracing isn't going to be possible. How do you crack down on things like this, and what's your response to this offshore wedding? Well, I think no matter where they have it, they, they have it at a function somewhere, be it a convention hall or a banquet hall. It's, it's their responsibility uh, to get the names, but also the people getting married. you, you got to give up the names. You know, and until we can we can contact trace them, God forbid, uh, you know something breaks out. But um, it, it's so important. It, it really we can do everything as a government. The healthcare workers can do everything. But if we have certain groups you know, within the public uh, aren't following the guidelines, it, it, it's very difficult. But the majority of people are like 99% of the people are. I'd even say more than 99 but you, you have a few folks that don't want to follow the guidelines. You're hurting everyone. You know, we just talked about the PSWs and your grandparents and parents help them out. You know, you, they don't need additional workload. So the quicker we can just give up the names and the phone numbers, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. We aren't, we're not going to do anything bad to them. We just got to make sure that we follow and trace them and track them. We put a billion dollars into that uh, for uh, testing, tracing and tracking. So it's only going to work if the, the people uh, cooperate, which the vast majority of the people are. Philip? Thank you, Premier. And you said the second wave numerous times now is going to be worse than the first. So 
by that logic, we'll at some point be going to stage two restrictions again or putting further restrictions in place. And I know that you're taking your advice from the health experts, from Dr. Williams and the public health table, but for families and businesses to be better prepared, what can you tell them in terms of numbers? What thresholds do hotspots like Toronto, Peel, Ottawa have to reach in order for that to happen? I'm going to turn this to Dr. Williams, but what we are focusing on are the hotspots, the Ottawa, the Toronto and the, and the Peel. We're there to support them. I know the federal government's there to support businesses, but the best way to help any business is everyone follows the protocols and guidelines and that the chief medical officer has laid out. The best way we can help them is to keep their doors open as long as we possibly can. Uh, that's how we can really help these, these folks by following the guidelines, bringing the numbers down. Uh, that, that's the best way of defense against this virus. But I'll pass it over to Dr. Williams. Yes, thank you, Premier. Um, when we are, people like to compare stage two and we're going to three and we're going back to two, you have to remember when we did that uh, through phase two, stage one, two, and three were not a reduction of close down, they were opening up. And that may sound like semantics. It was set up in a different perspective. Um, as we're now looking at the situation we're seeing, uh, as I give examples before, we didn't have schools opening or closing as part of that phase. We hope that the community numbers would be down and we would open up. So that as we're looking at these different methods of reducing, uh, we're strongly recommending that we don't uh, close schools at this stage and a number of areas. So we can be more strategic and look at the data and information of saying, where are the outbreaks occurring? Where are the cases occurring? Uh, you've heard of one event just now. We've worked at the social events and others. We keep bringing recommendations from our public health measure table based on the input we're receiving from our local medical officers of health and at our public health measures table. The other difference between now and opening up with the stages is that those were province wide as we were doing that. The impact of this is so far as the premiers alluded to has majority focused on three or four hotspots and therefore what can we do to work at some general methods that would help and then to go specifically at some things working with the local medical officers of health to deal with that. So it's not just a, a repeat of stage two, it may be stage, some things that are similar to stage two, but it's applied with a much more um, methodical metric and going at it in a way that is backed up by local data and what the local medical officer of health sees is also necessary to deal with the risk factors in the areas that they're seeing the impact of numbers in their local jurisdictions. So it's not just going back to two, it's basically a different thing plus and even more stringent in some areas in particular. So. Um, we were closing down some things that we already recommended that were in two, that we were back in one. So we will even go back to some areas there if it's necessary, those venues are the risk settings. Even if they were opened up after stage one to two, we might choose to close them now and leave some other ones open. So we have to be much more strategic and much more, the term is used, surgical. I would say more targeted and more meticulous on how we're gonna apply those as quickly as possible. Next question. Your next question comes from Laura Stone with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, Laura. Hi, Premier. Um, just on the point about additional restrictions, we're hearing there may be additional restrictions placed on restaurants in the near future. Are you planning on closing indoor dining in restaurants in certain hotspot areas, or what other additional measures are you going to take? Because surely these businesses need, to, need a heads up if they're going to be facing additional restrictions from the government? Yeah, good good, good question. Um, we, we're doing everything on evidence-based. You know, there has to be justification if we, we close down a restaurant or be at the banquet halls. And um, right now, I will pass it to Dr. Williams. Right, right now, as Dr. Williams said the other day, we're, we're seeing it more with the staff in the kitchen areas per se, more than the... Uh, more, more, more than the patrons. And, and I got to compliment all the restaurants. You guys are doing great. You're following the guidelines. Uh, you, you know, you're listening to the chief medical officer. This is their livelihood and they're, they're doing such a, a great job. And, you know, if we can reduce it to the tables of six, that would be, that would be uh, fabulous. And I know Toronto was brought down from hundred down to 75 in a restaurant, but I also always have to keep in mind the 10 regions in Ontario that don't have any cases at all, you know, they, they have to keep their livelihood going and, and moving forward. And I think there's five with less than five, if I'm not mistaken, cases. So we have to differentiate between the Ottawa, Toronto and Peel, 
versus the, the rest of the province, but I'll pass it to Dr. Williams. Yes, well, the Premier's covered most of the points there. Um, what we're looking at is the data. When we see outbreaks related to thus far with uh, restaurants, food service, venues, uh, we did close the some of the nightclubs that had a higher rate, and we see most of the infections tend to be among staff than not writ large, but we're finding that some are being less than stringent about the public health measures with their staff when they're not in with the patrons, which they've done a good job at, whether they're in the back rooms or pre-work and post-work. And we find there's even some staff are going from one site to another. We've heard some rumors that some staff are allowed to work even when they're feeling ill or when they are um, under quarantine. So just because a few are not adhering, it doesn't mean everyone should be uh, punished accordingly or deal dealt with. When you talk about the numbers and limitations on that, as the Premier said, Toronto's moved down to 75. A lot of restaurants, of course, can't even do 75. They know the physical layout with they're going to do the certain distancing right now, have never been able to cope with any more than 50 people anyways. So they're very much restaurant facility by facility and how it's laid out. And that's where we want to be understanding of that. And they put measures and protection in place. Nevertheless, if we see trends and directions in certain areas and it's backed up with data, we may have to move to further do some action. But this time we're taking the information and advice from our local medical officers, their data, their outbreak information, and working with our other team and outbreaks as well as with Dr. Heyer to identify any trends or directions. And that's what our public health measures table, if there was a concern to do something further, we would bring that back to the minister as well as to the premier and cabinet for further decision making. Follow up. Um, so just to clarify, um, Premier, are there any, is there anything imminent coming to the restaurant industry? And can you say yes or no, whether indoor dining will be closed, at least in these hot spot, quote unquote, areas? Uh, not, not right now. Uh, again, everything's on the table. If you ask me, you know, in four days and we're up over a thousand, things could change, but not, not right now. We just want everyone to continue following the, the guidelines. And uh, I, I just want to try to help these restaurant owners, the, these folks, they're, they're holding on by their fingernails. So just follow practicing, uh, practice uh, social distancing, again, hand sanitization and, and so on and so forth. But they're, they're doing everything they, they can to stay afloat. Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Hi, Premier. Just going back to the um, the, the personal support workers, um, they got uh, we gave them four dollars an hour, along with a lot of other people in a pandemic thing. So, I'm, I'm wondering why you went down to three dollars for this, and how do you think that's going to affect retention? And and also, um, what do you mean when you say eligible personal support workers? Who's not eligible? Well, I'll pass that over to the Minister of, of Health, but the vast majority of them. It's over $400 million we're, we're putting out to support the PSWs. And and believe me, I'm going to fight uh, tooth and nail to make sure we continue this past uh, March. And I, I know uh, Minister Elliott has been a champion when it comes to supporting our, our PSWs. And they're they're doing great. So I, actually, either minister, uh, because uh, I, I know Minister Fulton's been a champion. She's been on to me constantly about PSWs, supporting them. So... They're both very, very supportive. So I'll pass it over to either either one. Well, in terms of who would be eligible, it would be uh, anyone who is working in our, our publicly funded organizations, our hospitals, long-term care homes, and home and community care. And as for the amounts, how we determined that, what we were trying to achieve was a, a level of equity, I guess, amongst the different partners in the group with um, hospital workers generally tending to have higher salaries. They have some benefits as well. Uh, home and six, uh, home and community care, um, PSWs were among the lowest paid. So we we're trying to achieve more or less a balance in terms of equity so that with these changes, we wouldn't have a group of PSWs from one area, say hospitals leaving to go to long-term care homes or people going from developmental service workers to home and community care. So we wanted to make sure that we could achieve that sort of equity and uh, that amount, it was based on uh, comparisons we had with other jurisdictions. And uh, it's, I think we've landed on the right spot. Paula? 
Thanks, Minister. Yeah, I know the uh, the equity was a, was an issue. Um, uh, I'm going to switch gears over to the testing backlog. It's up, I think it's north of 82,000 today, and like Lorenda said earlier, that's the highest. What's this doing to the delays in people getting test results? Uh, 82,000 sounds like a, a full two-day backlog. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass this over to the, the Minister again. Well, we are working uh, very diligently to try and reduce the backlog uh, that, uh, as you know, the, uh, the samples or the specimens are only uh, good for three days and then they spoil and uh, people have to be retested. So we understand how urgently this needs to be addressed. We are putting, as uh, we've mentioned before, a billion dollars into testing, but also lab uh, analysis and uh, con case and contact management. Uh, we are looking to boost our lab capacity. We started originally with just uh, Public Health Ontario, able to do about 5,000 tests per day. We now have a network, but we're building on that network, and we've reached out to our uh, universities who are coming on board very shortly with uh, significant uh, lab capacity. And so that is what we're working to put together very shortly so that we can process those tests in time. This will be the final question. Your final question comes from Haley Cooper with News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, Haley. Thank you. Hi, Premier. When it comes to reporting on COVID cases in schools, we wanted to know why there is a category that says not identified and why we can't just say if it's a staff member or a student and why there would be a privacy issue. Yeah, good good point. It could be a custodian uh, or other, other support workers. I'll pass it to the minister. Thank you. Well, I think it is in recognition of the fact that it could be a, a student, it could be a teacher, but it could be one of any other number of people. It could be a custodian, it could be a bus driver, it could be um, uh, one of the support workers working in administration. So uh, that is the reason for it. And uh, that's why we need to, um, we're being as broad and as transparent as possible, but that's the reason why. Follow up. Thank you. And my follow up is for the Premier. We are wondering if you've spoken with the major grocers about maybe bringing their weekly deals in line with each other just temporarily, uh, because right now you have shoppers going from store to store to store to store chasing deals on produce or meat yeah. or what have you, and as the case numbers are modeled to reach 1,000 a day by the middle of the month, having people chase these deals and bounce yeah. between multiple stores seems kind of counterproductive. Yeah, I agree. You, you just gave me two good questions. Your first one, uh, by the way, as soon as I saw that, I asked the same same question. And this is a great question too. It's very competitive out there in the retail uh, market, no, no matter if it's Loblaw, Sobeys, Metro, Walmart, Costco, they're all competing against each other. And I, I hear you. It makes it a lot easier if they all coordinate. But I guess in a free market society, every, everyone's going at each other and I think competition is good, but it'd make life a lot easier. And it is a great question if they'd coordinate, you know, a can of beans all at the same place because it stops people from running around all the stores. But it's a real competitive market out there. And uh, they're, they're kind of going at each other. And the margins, people don't realize how small the margins are. The volume's huge, but the margins are so small in, in retail and a lot of the, the suppliers is, as well. I just, I just want to keep the supply going and moving forward but i promise you one thing ellie i will ask the ceos of all of them when i when i speak to them and see what their answer is it, it doesn't hurt if someone could you know put milk on sale right across the board maybe coordinate uh what you guys are doing but keep in mind they're, they're it's vicious competition with with those uh folks so i will ask i promise you i'll uh, make the calls and uh get back to you on an answer Okay, thank okay, you everyone. Thank, thank you so much everyone. Thank you.